All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Jose, and uh, thank you all for joining my presentation. Uh, good morning to the one in the US, I guess, good afternoon in Europe, and good evening in Asia. So, um, so this will be a, a talk on uh, transition metal dicarcotinides, uh, which are materials that are not uh, really known for their magnetic properties. Um, but uh, I will look into some materials that have maybe potential uh, for, for mag magnetism. Uh, before I start, um, let me thank the people here, the uh, my group, who did uh, most of the work. Uh, we collaborate with people at Synchrotron, uh, at Soleil in Paris, and Alba in Barcelona. And uh, we also have uh, support for, from theorists at my institution at USF, but also around the world in, in, in Poland and, and, and Germany. All right, um, let me give you a brief introduction about uh, transition metal dicarcotinides. Uh, you're probably familiar with that, but uh, anyway, so you have two, two uh, main uh, uh, structures, which is a 1T structure or the 2H structure, which differs in the coordination of the uh, transition metal atoms. So you either have an octahedral coordination or a trigonal prismatic um, coordination of the uh, transition metal. And that gives uh, rise to different um, symmetries of the uh, orbitals, of the d orbitals of the transition metals. And, uh, and so depending in which uh, group you are or how many d electrons you have in your system, you will get either uh, semiconducting or metallic phases. And uh, for example, if you look at the group six elements, which uh, I guess is the molybdenum dicarcinides are, are the standard uh, transition metal dicarcinides. If you were in a 1T coordination, the group six metals are metallic. Uh, the group six uh, TMDs are metallic, while of course in the H configuration, you no know, molybdenum disulfide is a semiconductor. And so sometimes you can have materials, you can have phase change from the H to the T structure, so you can switch. If you have uh, molybdenum sulfide, you can switch it uh, to the metallic 1T phase, so you can uh, switch between semiconducting and metallic. Um, so, um, as I said, um, <clears throat> especially in the early uh, 1T uh, phases, you have a difference in the D electrons. And so uh, the electronic structure may be looking very similar uh, in the sense that uh, if you do Arpus and you have at the gamma point, you have the calcitrogen P orbitals. And then at the M point, you have the D electrons. So this is, for example, tit titanium disulfide which uh, nominally has no D electrons, so the D electron pocket should be almost empty, which is the case here. You have some D electrons uh, around the endpoints, which uh, may be due to doping. While if you go to uh, vanadium, you go one element over, you have one D electron. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see that, or this is all blocked by, by my, my view. But uh, anyway, so... Um, in vanadium disulfide, uh, you have the similar um, uh, selenium p orbitals, but then the d electrons are occupied with one uh, one electron, and you see um, the large uh, d electron pockets around the m, m point. So, <clears throat> so uh, let me uh, tell you something about the, the growth we are doing, which is mainly uh, Van der Waals epitaxy. And uh, that was um, something first proposed by uh, Professor Koma from the University of Tokyo already uh, quite a while back, 40 years ago, uh, which uh, he uh, named Van der Waals epitaxy. You know, in, in traditional epitaxy, you grow 3D material, uh, three-dimensional materials on top of each other, and you need to have a matching condition at the interface to minimize uh, interface defects. Uh, lattice matching. Now, the idea with Van der Waals epitaxy is that if you put a Van der Waals material that does not have any dangling bonds on, let's say, a, a terminated or passivated 3D material, 
then you don't have this matching condition and you can get uh, much better interfaces then you can take it uh, one step further and throw one Van der Waals material on top of a Van der Waals material so there are no dangling bonds at all and have a, a, a very sharp, uh, atomically sharp interface. And the idea there is that you can uh, integrate very different materials without the limitation of lattice matching and, of course, get very well-defined interfaces. So what we do is... Uh, and of this Van der Waals epitaxy using a, a molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, so we deposit in a vacuum chamber the elements we want to condense on the surface. And uh, most of the time we use Van der Waals substrates to grow on top. One popular substrate for us is molybdenum di disulfide, which you can buy as a single crystal and cleave in air or in vacuum to get a, a well-defined uh, surface. This is low energy electron diffraction where you see the uh, single crystal structure. Now, if you grow on top of that, another Van der Waals material, oops, sorry. <coughs> In this case, uh, vanadium ditellaride, what you see is the vanadium ditellaride grows rotationally aligned with the substrate. So it's also a single crystal, uh, but it maintains its own lattice constant. So the lattice constant diffraction spots of vanadium ditellaride and the diffraction spots of the substrate molysulfide are separate and they grow uh, in, their own, um, in their own lattice constant, but this rotational registry to the substrate. And we can also look with uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, how this looks in this case is vanadium diselenide uh, on molysulfide. So you have these vanadium diselenide islands, these are monoatomically or mono layer height steps, and the molysulfide underneath. But it's all perfectly aligned. And if you zoom in, then you see another modulation, which is a, a, a weak um, moray pattern uh, that originates from, from the lattice uh, mismatch between the two, two materials. So, other substrates you might want to use are, are uh, graphene and silicon carbide. Again, uh, graphene and silicon carbide is nice because you can grow, uh, <clears throat> uh, or this uh, graphene is single crystalline on the silicon carbide single crystal. And it, it's, uh, the graphene is obviously conducting, so that may help in, in some, some characterizations. Um, however, in, in many systems, uh, if you grow a film on top, here again, vanadium ditellaride, it is rotationally aligned, but not perfectly like on molysulfide, where you get really very sharp fraction spots from the vanadium ditellaride. But instead, you get a little bit an, an arc feature, which shows you that you have a distribution of uh, rotation angles. Uh, nevertheless, the orientation usually is good enough for doing um, uh, measurements like, like ARPUS on, on these materials. Um, a third substrate that is popular is uh, 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 gold or any FCC 111 surface, gold 111 in particular. And this is a, um, an example from the literature where you can have the substrate and and then you see the grown film. What you see here is that you get many more spots, which are due to a, a, a moray structure, which is much more pronounced you know, on a metal surface than it is on, um, on for example, here on molysulfide, uh, which indicates a much stronger interaction between the transition metal dicarcogenide and the, and the gold substrate. But again, you get a very good uh, rotational alignment with respect to the substrate and therefore that single crystal. Um, all right. Um, sorry, let me. Okay. Um, another thing you may be uh, concerned about is, is uh, the formation of mirror domains. So, you know, in a TMD has no uh, mirror symmetry. So you have, uh, if you mirror one domain over to the other, you get a different structure. Um, uh, and so if you use, for example, graphene as a growth substrate, which has mirror symmetry, uh, then you would always expect uh, growing a TMD on graphene that you get both mirror domains at the same time. While if you use a substrate with the same symmetry, like for example, gold 111 again, which is also mirror symmetric, then under the right growth conditions, you may be able to only obtain a single um, 
a single mural domain that is aligned with the substrate. Um, that is important, uh, for example, in materials like uh, moly, uh, uh, moly sulfide or tungsten uh, sulfide, where you know that the K and K prime point are not equivalent in the monolayer, uh, which uh, because of the broken inversion symmetry in the monolayer gives rise to um, uh, spin polarization at the K point. You know, you have the strong spin, spin orbit splitting at the K point. Um, and um, in the monolayer, the K point and K prime point are non-equivalent with a spin up and spin down uh, uh, polarization inverted for the two, um, two K points. Um, and this has been shown that if you grow on gold, for example, you get a single, single domain and therefore, you can see the spin polarization, for example, here in uh, spin resolved ARPIS measurement that shows that the K and K primes, the spin polarization is uh, inverted, showing that you really have a single, single domain structure. But for having that, you have to grow on a substrate that has uh, the right symmetry uh, relative to the TMD. All right. Now, <clears throat> Uh, so that was kind of the introduction to TMDs and um, uh, the growth procedure. And now I want to discuss a few examples uh, and the information we might get out of uh, growing monolayers and their characterization. Uh, so I will look at vanadium diselenide, vanadium ditellaride, and chromium ditellaride. And uh, then at the end, if, if there's time, uh, which I should have, this is one hour talk uh, to, to talk about um, defect formation in uh, vacuum processes. Right. Okay. So for vinium diselenide, the, the question has come up if, if you can uh, get uh, ferromagnetic ordering in the monolayer while in the bulk, the bulk material is paramagnetic. Of course, we know that uh, many monolayers exhibit different properties than the bulk materials. And the question is uh, if there is such a thing as, as monolayer ferromagnetism uh, in, in vanadium diselenide. And uh, this really has started off with this DFT calculation uh, already quite some quite a while back, uh, which suggested that um, there's existence of uh, magnetism in uh, vanadium sulfide and vanadium selenide. Uh, in the monolayer regime. Um, and subsequently, there has been a, uh, there have been quite a few um, DFT calculations that support this idea. They all come up to the conclusion that the ferromagnetic ordering is a ground state in these, these materials. Uh, there's some controversy about the structure because uh, at least in the bulk, we know that the T structure is, is a uh, usual structure observed observed in vanadium selenide, uh, some of these calculations uh, also suggest that the uh, H structure may be, may be preferred. But uh, so the question is, is, is this um, the correct prediction uh, that we have considered? And uh, there have been uh, quite a few um, you know, also experimental studies using uh, uh, magnetometry that showed that there's some uh, magnetism in vanadium diselenide. So the earliest study was this, uh, on this liquid exfoliation of vanadium diselenide, um, where they see after exfoliation and spin coating on a substrate, they see a magnetic MH hysteresis loop. Uh, this our early work on, on the growth of vanadium selenide on different substrates, and, and, and we also see a hysteresis and uh, similarly from others, uh, MB grown vanadium selenide on, on graphene. Um, but the question is, is this all defect-induced magnetism or is this real uh, intrinsic magnetism in, in the material? So is the monolayer vanadium selenide really ferromagnetic? Um, <clears throat> the DFT predictions, uh, or, or the reason why, why it's ferromagnetic is uh, because it's an itinerant uh, band magnet in DFT calculations. So if you look at spin-polarized DFT calculations, they have a very large uh, splitting between a minority, uh, minority and majority band of up to 500 uh, uh, MeV splitting uh, uh, in these DFT calculations. But uh, a note of caution is uh, that 
you do DFT calculations, spin polarized DFT calculations also for the bulk, you also see uh, uh, in the spin polarized calculation a splitting of the band. So the, the bulk in these calculations should also be magnetic. Also, the splitting is, is somewhat less in the bulk. But uh, for the bulk, at least, it's very well known that um, there's no, no magnetism in minium disolonite. Uh, so already uh, for the bulk, the DFT calculation contradict with the experimental uh, known uh, phase of vanadium disolonide. All right. So <clears throat> if you look at these uh, spin polarized uh, calculations, we can compare those uh, with, with ARPIS me measurements of our samples. So this is uh, vanadium sulfide grown on molysulfide. And so you see these very faint bands here, which are from the molysulfide substrate, but otherwise you get the nice uh, selenium p orbitals and, and the uh, vanadium d, d bands. And in these calculations, you only see a single d band. There's no indication, indication of the uh, spin splitting here. It's maybe better seen in the Fermi surface mapping um, if you compare the experimental Fermi surface with the spin polarized Fermi surface. It's, uh, uh, it looks quite quite different. Um, so there's no indication in the uh, experimental ARPIS measurements of uh, spin split uh, bands. So that would suggest that DFT predictions are wrong in that respect. Uh, and if you compare it with a uh, non-spin polarized DFT, uh, you obviously only get a single band, then you get very good agreement uh, for the spin non-spin polarized uh, uh, calculations with the experimental, the observed band structure. All right. So, so the question is, of course, uh, why would DFT predict the wrong ground state? And one idea is that um, there may be competing ground states. Uh, all these uh, calculations have not taken into account that uh, vanadium disulfide. It's a charge density wave material in the bulk. Uh, at least we see a nice uh, four by four structure on the bulk surface, which is well known. And so you may want to take this uh, uh, charge density wave order into uh, consideration. Um, and uh, maybe the charge density wave uh, competes with the thermagnetic ordering in the state. Uh, so the first question then to answer would be, does the monolayer exhibit a charge density wave at all? and uh, would that affect the ferromagnetic ordering, right? So to do that, uh, um, we do um, STM uh, measurements at low temperature, not very low, so it's 80 Kelvin. And what you see, you see a superstructure. So, so this again is a molysulfide. So these dark spots come from the moray superstructure with respect to the uh, substrate. But then on top, you don't see just a single hexagonal atomic order, but you see a, a, a charge density if order, which uh, is very different from, from or it's different from, from the bulk. So it's clearly not a four by four structure. But if you look at the uh, unit cell, what you get is uh, more like a square root three and square root seven. And uh, the diagonal of this uh, unit cell would be square root 13 of the lattice constant. And um, yes, so that's this. And uh, uh, if you take this um, square root 13 and the, the direction, so what, what I've got here, the, the gray lines are the one by one unit cell, and then the direction of the square root 13 would be rotated by 13.9 degrees. So if you plot this uh, in reciprocal space, then uh, that would indicate a, a nesting vector of the Fermi surface. So the Fermi sheets, the left and right, can be translated on top of each other with this um, uh, vector, uh, which would suggest it's uh, um, the charge density wave is stable, stabilized by a Fermi nesting condition. And we can look at different uh, nesting vectors uh, to see that this uh, uh, structure is, is the uh, preferred one. Um, so you can, uh, if you think of a, that the charge density wave has to be a com commensurate structure with a, a lattice, then you have only discrete uh, values available for, for the um, nesting vectors. One would be um, 
uh, the one uh, translating one Fermi sheet directly on top of each other perpendicular. That would be the two times square three direction. However, uh, this Fermi vector is, is too long compared to the measured Fermi surface. The other one you may consider as a four by four, like uh, for the bulk, we know we have a four by four superstructure. That uh, nesting vector would be too short. And uh, really the one that agrees well is the uh, one experimentally observed uh, square root 13 that you can shift one Fermi uh, sheet on top of the other. So uh, in that sense, the charge density wave is uh, uh, described by Fermi surface nesting. Um, alternatively, you can look um, at the phonon spectrum, uh, which also clearly indicates that uh, there's a phonon instability and therefore a charge density wave. So if we do a uh, phonon calculation for the non-spin polarized structure, which is this uh, Fermi surface, then you get um, imaginary phonon modes, uh, which would give rise to the charge density wave. On the other hand, if you use the spin polarized calculations, uh, which gives you a, 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 this kind of Fermi surface, uh, then there are no imaginary phonon modes and the surface should not undergo a charge density wave transition. So from that, that's also consistent with our observ observations that uh, we name disalonite is a non-magnetic uh, material with a charge density wave. Um, and that's, uh, the charge density wave is consistent uh, with the absence of a spin split band in, in ARPUS. Um, we can uh, take these phonon spectra and do a, a structural search. Uh, so using the uh, unit cell, we measure experimentally and minimize the structure with the USPEX code uh, and uh, then simulate the STM image of such a structure and that simulated relaxed uh, structure is in very good agreement with the experiments. And importantly, if you do these relaxations, is a charge density wave, then the energy of the structure obviously is, is lowered and it turns out that the energy, at least on the level of DFT, is lower than the energy for the spin polarized uh, uh, calculations. So in other words, the charge density wave has a lower energy than the ferromagnetic ordered state. And uh, therefore, we believe that this uh, charge density wave uh, ordering competes with the ferromagnetic ordering in uh, vinium disalonite. And uh, that's why we don't see ferromagnetic ferromagnetism in the monolayer, but the charge density wave instead. Well, uh, then uh, the question still remains, why do we see magnetism in uh, magnetometry? Uh, so one thing I should point out is that if you grow at very low growth temperatures, then we also don't see magnetism in, um, in uh, uh, magnetometry. However, if we anneal the sample subsequently, then the magnetism occurs, which uh, would suggest that some, some defects are induced. Very recently, um, uh, Andrew Wee's group in, in Singapore did also some studies on that. Uh, they did STM with increasing annealing temperature. So this is uh, annealed at 400, and it's increasing annealing temperatures. We see a higher concentration of defects in the vinium disalonite. And then they did XMCD uh, for the pristine sample. So the, the dots here are the XMCD signals. So you don't see any XMCD. Uh, after annealing, I would say they see a fairly weak uh, XMCD, XMCD signal, which is consistent maybe with uh, that the magnetism is uh, originating from, from defects. This very weak magnetism, I don't think quite explains the strong magnetism we observe in, um, in uh, VSM measurements. So there's still uh, uh, some, some uncertainty where, where this really originates from, but it does not originate from the vanadium disalonite film itself. Right. So uh, to conclude some uh, observation of vanadium selenite is that um, uh, we see, if you grow vanadium selenite, on various substrate, we, we see stereosis loops, but uh, it's not from an internal magnetism in the vanadium disalonite. Um, and the monolayers do exhibit a charge density wave, which uh, in, in conjunction with DFT suggests that uh, the charge density wave is the ground state 
and uh, blocks the ferromagnetic ordering in this uh, material. Uh, while defects in vinyl disulfide seem to induce some weak defect induced magnetization. Right. All right, uh, let me move on to uh, vinyl ditelluride. And uh, the motivation obviously comes to compare vinyl ditelluride with vinyl disulfide. Both have been uh, initially predicted to be magnetic. And, um, but before we can understand vinyl ditelluride, we should Remind ourselves that vinyl ditelluride has a slightly different structure than vinyl disulfide, which is really a, a distorted 1T structure, or in this case, a 1T double prime structure. And uh, to understand this distortion, um, we can uh, look at the electronic structure. As I said, vinyl disulfide has one D electron, and uh, therefore, uh, the simple 1T structure is, is preferred. So this is the top view, just indicating the hexagonal structure of this. Uh, we all know the 1T prime structure, which, for example, exists in uh, tungsten ditelluride. Uh, the difference is the count of, of uh, D electrons, uh, where in uh, tungsten you have two D electrons. And these additional D electrons give rise to in-plane metal-metal uh, uh, interactions or hybridization, uh, which gives rise to this six-x structure between the uh, tungsten atoms. Um, <clears throat> now, the 1T double prime structure lies somewhere in between uh, the 1D electron and 2D electrons. Uh, so it's a D1 plus, plus epsilon electrons. And that gives rise to this uh, uh, three times periodicity in the plane of this uh, ribbon structure. Uh, so this would be a, a one by one hexagonal structure, or this is a two by one hexagonal structure, and this would be a three by one hexagonal, uh, three by one structure with respect to the hexagonal lattice. Um, so the question then is, uh, where does this extra uh, extra charge on the d electrons come from? And uh, that already was explained uh, uh, almost uh, thirty years ago. Uh, in these tellurium compounds, you have fairly strong interlayer interactions of the tellurium atoms. And uh, these tellurium, tellurium contacts give rise to charge transfer from the tellurium orbitals into the uh, metals and the D electrons of the metals. And uh, therefore, in these tellurides, you have some more D electrons, which then gives rise to this ribbon, ribbon destruction. Obviously, uh, then. What this would imply is that if you remove the interlayer interactions, like if you go to a monolayer material where you don't have any interlayer interactions, then uh, the monolayer may convert back to the uh, simple 1T structure. And uh, this 1T structure then may have different properties of the, to the distorted um, 1T double prime structure. And so that's uh, also what we observe. Uh, if we grow monolayer vinyl ditelluride here on molysulfide, you see nice hexagonal structures. There's no indication of a distortion and maybe more uh, clear in, in diffraction, low energy electron diffraction, where you see the faint substrate spots of molysulfide and then you only see a hexagonal structure of vinyl ditelluride for the monolayer. So indeed, uh, for monolayer vinyl ditelluride, we just see the simple 1T structure, not the distorted structure. However, uh, if you do phonon calculations on, on the simple 1T structure, which is uh, equivalent to the structure in vinyl disulfide, um, you again see imaginary phonon modes. Uh, so the 1T structure in vinyl ditelluride also should undergo a uh, charge sensitive wave transition. And that's indeed what we observe at low temperature. If you do STM at 20 Kelvin, what you see is a, um, a four by four unit cell. And that is very similar to the four by four unit cell you see in bulk vinyl disulfide, uh, which is not surprising because vinyl disulfide in the 1T structure and vinyl telluride in the 1T structure are both isoelectronic, so they have the same, same electronic structure, and therefore also undergoes the same charge-sensitive transition. 
Uh, now, what happens if you grow multi-layer? So this is a large-scale STM. So these are the monolayer islands. This is the substrate step, and then uh, you grow bilayer. So you see the monolayer, second-layer islands, and then uh, you grow multi-layers. So it gets a little rougher, but it grows uh, nicely layer by layer. So for the multi-layer, we would expect the one T structure, uh, one T double prime structure. Uh, so again, uh, this is the monolayer, one T. That's a multi-layer. So in the 1T double prime structure, or the ribbon structure, we should see a three, three by one unit cell. However, what we measure experimentally is a two by one unit cell. And uh, of course, then you have uh, three rotational domains of the two by one. And you see that in, in lead also very clearly that you get the two by one superstructure space. So it's not the bulk structure you would expect for vinium ditelluride. It's similar to the 1T prime structure, but that we wouldn't expect for a material like vanadium telluride. So what's going on? Uh, an alternative explanation is that we actually do not grow vanadium ditelluride, but instead uh, we get additional vanadium atoms in between the uh, transition metal dichalcinide layers. And um, it is known for these early transition metals that there is a a variation of um, what I call intercalation compounds in the sense that you have excess vanadium atoms or metal atoms in between the layers. And depending on how many extra metals you put in between the layers, you get different, different ordered structures. Um, in the top view, you may call these a two by two, square root three times square root three structure, or this two by one structure, which seems very similar to what we observe experimentally. And uh, did some DFT calculation for a bilayer structure. This is two by one composition. You would get this buckling of the surface layer uh, of the transition metal dichalcinide layer that's very similar to the 1T prime structure. And if you look with uh, STM or if you sim simulate the STM image of that, you would get a very similar uh, corrugation to what we observe uh, experimentally. Um, these multilayers, unfortunately, um, are also non-magnetic, non as we see from XMCD studies. So then for vinyl telluride, uh, let me conclude that, um, interestingly, the monolayer of vinyl ditelluride is different from the bulk structure. It has a simple 1T structure, which then also undergoes a charge sensitive wave transition. Uh, which, which is identical to what is observed for bulk vanadium disalonide. But if you grow multilayer, or if you attempt to grow multilayer vanadium ditelluride by MBE, it is likely that we get uh, not a nicely layered structure, but a structure with intercalated vanadium in between or vanadium 3, 2, and 4 composition, which uh, is non magnetic. So this, this intercalation is, is important uh, in a moment when, when we talk about chromium telluride. And so keep that in mind. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, the third point is to uh, look at chromium ditelluride, look at the monolayer, uh, see if you can uh, synthesize monolayers similar to what we did for vanadium telluride. And then uh, the question is the monolayer is 1T or 1H. So, chromium telluride or chromium, of course, is in the same column as molybdenum and tungsten, which, which are the most commonly known transition metal dichalcinides. So, why are there not more studies on, on chromium ditelluride? Well, the answer is that chromium ditelluride and also chromium disalonide is really not, not a very stable compound, and uh, it prefers to uh, decompose. Uh, so, if you have this. TMDC likes to decompose by uh, uh, into the calcations and the transition metals really like to go into the Van der Waals gap and forms this kind of intercalation compound. Um, the question then is, can we stabilize TMDCs, especially as a monolayer by MBE growth? Okay. And so we did some uh, ab initio uh, uh, molecular dynamics simulations. Um, and of course, if you uh, have this intercalation compound here as a, a bilayer uh, on a molysulfide substrate, that's fairly stable. 
and and uh, uh, if you anneal it to computer, it leads to 600 Kelvin, it does not change. Now, uh, you could think, okay, if you make it thinner and thinner, then eventually we end up with a single layer of uh, uh, TMDs, and <coughs> uh, you may end up with a, a chromium ditelluride monolayer material, and indeed, if you calculate it in, in the computer, it, it's stable as a monolayer, so you could possibly get the monolayer chromium ditelluride. What you may be worried about is that uh, you may also get um, chromium atoms within the gap between here molysulfide and chromium telluride. So if you put excess chromium atoms in here and we anneal that, then that would not be a stable configuration. It, it just turns into some amorphous uh, mass in, uh, if you anneal it. So this would just suggest that there's a chance to stabilize uh, chromium ditelluride uh, if you can grow it, grow it as a single layer. And uh, that's what we see if we go by MBE again on, on molysulfide. Um, <coughs> you get these uh, large monolayer regions and then some bilayer and multilayer islands. And if you look at the cross sections, the step height here from the substrate, the first layer height is 0.6 nanometer consistent with a single layer. Uh, more importantly, in, um, in LEED, what you see is the uh, sharp diffraction spots of a one by one unit cell. And we also see that in STM. While again, if you go multi layers, you can again get this intercalation effect for chromium telluride, uh, which looks very similar for, to what we've seen for vanadium ditelluride, that you uh, <coughs> get uh, this corrugation and uh, two by one uh, lead, um, lead structure. So, the question, of course, then is, uh, is chromium ditelluride 1T or 2H? Uh, <coughs> uh, from uh, experience of molybdenum, we would think that the H phase is, is, is preferred. Uh, and uh, as I indicated at the beginning, the H phase should be uh, semiconducting, while the T phase should be uh, metallic. Well, there are also um, chromium telluride is, is it's not very stable. Um, there are some uh, uh, bulk samples, and the real bulk samples are 1T. And what's interesting about that chromium ditelluride is that it is uh, ferromagnetic, um, as is shown here from a, a exfoliated bulk material. And these are um, uh, room temperature uh, smoke experiments that show for, for the Thick flakes, 80 nanometer, it's a nice hysteresis loop, and uh, as it gets thinner, the hysteresis uh, disappears. However, no one has been able to exfoliate a single monolayer, and as I said, this is room temperature, so the magnetism may still uh, persist at, at lower temperatures. Um, okay, so, but do we then expect to get a 1T structure in uh, MBE growth? Uh, one big caveat here in the bulk samples is because it's metastable, so you have to do some tricks to stabilize the chromium ditelluride samples. And the tricks they do is uh, they grow a potassium intercalated chromium telluride material first uh, at high temperature, and then they can extract the potassium atoms at low temperatures, chemical means to get the chromium ditelluride. Now, it's well known that if you have alkali metals uh, in a TMD, the alkali metals obviously donate the electron to the TMD, and that can stabilize the 1T phase um, over the uh, maybe thermodynamically stable uh, H phase, which is, uh, for example, well known for molysulfide, where you can do lithium doping of molysulfide and it transforms into, into the 1H phase. So the question then is, is this bulk phase only a thermodynamically trapped uh, 1T phase and not really the um, thermodynamically favored phase. Um, if you do DFT calculations, then uh, you see that the 1H phase is largely favored over the 1T phase for the monolayer um, uh, by 0.5 EV. And as expected, the 1H phase should be semiconducting and the 1T phase is, is metallic. Um, all we have done so far on the monolayer is scanning tunneling spectroscopy. And indeed, what we see is a, a semiconducting gap of, uh, on 0.3 EV, which surprisingly is smaller than what is uh, predicted by DFT. 
Um, and then if you have some bilayer islands, those become metallic, which is probably due to the formation of intercalation uh, compounds. Um, if you do um, XMCD, uh, then not surprisingly, if it's a semiconducting phase, then there's no, no magnetism either to be uh, detected in the monolayer of chromium ditellaride. Uh, but uh, so it would be interesting to see if it can be switched into the 1T phase and uh, maybe it would become magnetic uh, at that point. All right. um, however, um, this is an interesting aspect that we can grow uh, multi layers of chromium uh, telluride, which forms an intercalation compound, uh, probably chromium 3, telluride 4 in our case. And uh, from uh, up in issue, MD calculations, we know that uh, the, if you grow it on a Van der Waals material, it likes to have a Van der Waals gap in between. So in, in a way, also the material itself is not a Van der Waals material, but, uh, but has um, interlayer uh, covalent bonding. Um, we can grow it as an ultra thin foam, uh, which is a pseudo Van der Waals material, still has a Van der Waals gap, and also in, in uh, STM of uh, Thin films, it, it grows very nicely as uh, like a Van der Waals epitaxic growth. And uh, these films then are ferromagnetic, uh, as we, so that's for a six to seven layer thick film of chromium telluride. We're still in the process to, to do layer dependent studies. So, so the um, pandemic uh, slowed us down here a little bit, but for the six to seven layer film, we see very strong, uh, uh, nice uh, XMCD signal. Uh, the TC is around uh, around 200 Kelvin, and at low temperature, you see nice MH hysteresis. So these are ultra thin films that you can grow with MBE, but may not be able to exfoliate very easily because of covalent bonding. They make very interesting uh, 2D um, or few layer 2D uh, uh, paramagnetic materials. Okay. Um, so uh, then summarizing chromium telluride. So we can grow monolayer chromium ditelluride if we grow at very low temperatures uh, or for MD at 300 degrees Celsius. If we grow at higher temperature, again, it likes to form multilayers uh, from the beginning or intercalation compounds from the beginning. Um, we think that the uh, uh, monolayer we grow this way is 1H phase because of the uh, observed band gap. We see also we uh, need to do some more, more work here to, to finally confirm the 1H phase. Um, and for multilayers, you get the self intercalated compounds uh, that are paramagnetically ordered with uh, TC around 200 Celsius. Right. So, in the last 15 minutes or so, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, defect formation in uh, TMDs and especially under vacuum processing conditions. So sometimes um, if you grow films with MBE, you get uh, different phase or different structures than you uh, may initially expect it. And uh, that certainly has been the case for us for molysolenite and molytelluride, where we would expect to get just a, a H phase of, um, of the material. But instead, uh, so this is a layer of molysolenite grown on uh, uh, graphite or, or, or molysulfide. What you see is, uh, well, your terraces are cross-hatched with all these lines that are very bright in, in STM images. And if you zoom in, you get this uh, uh, nice uh, kind of a spoke wheel structure uh, uh, of, uh, in, in, this, in this surface. And um, what these are are really um, uh, grain boundaries between grains, um, uh, more specifically mirror grains. So where you have one grain uh, mirrored relative to the other one going around in a circle. So every, every, every triangle here is a mirror domain of the other one. And in between you have these mirrored grain boundaries. Uh, so if you zoom in, you see the uh, uh, atomic corrugation along this mirror grain boundaries, and this corresponds very well with uh, DFT-simulated uh, uh, structures, STM 
the DXT simulated SDM images, images of this, this structure. Um, <clears throat> uh, so in SDM, they show up bright because they are metallic embedded in the uh, uh, molysalinide semiconducting um, phase. So, and the nice thing is that all these uh, grain boundaries are perfectly aligned relative to each other because we go epitaxially the molysalinide on the molysulfide substrate. And this allows us to do uh, angular cell photo emission spectroscopy on these structures. And you can see the, the bands of the molysalinide, so the valence band here. And then within the band gap, you see these defect states from these uh, high density of, of grain boundaries. And uh, these defect states have a nice parabolic dispersion. And then uh, perpendicular to the defects, you have these, these lines that have a, a one dimensional Fermi surface, uh, which suggests this, that these are really one dimensional electron structures. And uh, if you're interested in, in Tumnanga Latinger liquid and, and properties like that, then I, I refer you to this uh, paper, um, which we already published, published three years ago. Um, so here I, I want to discuss the formation of these uh, twin grain boundaries. Um, and uh, what we have to realize is, uh, if you look at these uh, twin grains, so the left and right is, a, a, you know, the left is a twin of the right, then the grain boundary is enriched in, in molybdenum. So while this molybdenum diselenide in the grains, the grain boundary is molybdenum one, selenium one. And so that, uh, what does uh, give us the idea that these grain boundaries may form just by incorporation of excess molybdenum in the crystal structure. And uh, you can see this schematically here. If, if you take this lattice, cut out a piece and translate the uh, molybdenum sublattice uh, by a fractional unit cell vector, then you would form this grain boundary on this side and that side. And on the other side, you would have missing atoms that you can fill in with molybdenum to form. A, a grain boundary triangular loop, which is similar to what we see in our, our experiments. So the question is, uh, can we form these grain boundaries just by incorporation of uh, excess transition metal? And to test that, we take a, a single crystal here of uh, a molydi-telluride in vacuum, uh, which has uh, very few defects to start with. And then we just deposit uh, excess molybdenum onto the surface at a slightly elevated temperature of 350 Celsius. And what you see is uh, the formation of these triangular uh, grain boundary loops uh, uh, as you deposit uh, molybdenum atoms. And as you deposit more molybdenum and more and more, you get a very high density of these grain boundary loops or grain boundary networks, similar to what we observed in the MBE growth. So uh, in molytelluride, you can. Uh, get an astonishingly large amount of excess molybdenum into this uh, molytelluride that, that is up to 20% of uh, molybdenum. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we confirmed that by DFT calculations. So if you put uh, molybdenum into the interstitial side of the molytelluride uh, lattice and then add a second molybdenum atom, uh, then uh, these will uh, uh, slowly transform the surface into these uh, grain boundary loops just by adding molybdenum and translating some of the other molybdenum atoms. Um, so importantly, the process of, of, the, of the growth of these uh, uh, triangular loops is all energetically downhill. So the loops want to get bigger and bigger by adding more and more molybdenum uh, to it. Um, and so we confirmed that for molytelluride, Similar, similar mechanisms occur on molysalinide, and uh, it's not active on molybdenum sulfide. Uh, and the difference between those is mainly the uh, uh, lattice size, so it's easier to incorporate transition or interstitials in the larger lattice uh, of molytelluride, while molysalinide has too small interstitial size to put in extra molybdenum atoms. Um, so we can look at the uh, uh, energetics. Um, we can compare, if you put a single extra molybdenum atom on the surface, we can look at what the energy is of the molybdenum in at atom side in what we call a split uh, metal side. So we put two 
molecular atoms in, in the side of a molecule or in the interstitial side. And in, indeed, uh, on molytellurite, the molybdenum always wants to go into its interstitial sites. It's a, by far the energetically favored position. It doesn't want to sit on top. And uh, if you add two atoms, then it also becomes favored for both molytellurite and molysalinite. But it's never favored for molysulfide, where the molybdenum atoms like to remain on the surface and form metal clusters. All right. So, if that works for molybdenum atoms, then the question was, uh, can we put other transition metals into the lattice of molytellurite? And um, uh, maybe some of those may be uh, magnetic. Uh, so uh, Arkady Kashaninikov did uh, the calculations for, for the entire periodic table to see which one might go into the lattice. And uh, so this is a little crowded, but it just uh, shows you it's a calculation for molysulfide, molysalinide, molytellurite. Uh, for the uh, top side, where you would get metal atom clustering, uh, atoms, transition metals replacing the uh, calcium atom at the surface or going into the interstitial side. Um, for us, experimentally, what we looked at is uh, for titanium and vanadium in molytellurite, because for both of those, the interstitial uh, occupation should be energetically favored. Um, and uh, furthermore, a uh, calculation would indicate that, uh, indicate that vanadium would have a magnetic moment uh, in the interstitial side while titanium uh, would not be magnetic. So then we started uh, with molybdenum ditellurite. Again, it's a single crystal surface, so it's not a brown foam. Um, and uh, we cleave it and, and look with SDM. Uh, again, it's single crystal, so it's fairly few defects. There are some native defects uh, that show up here as a sprite, uh, which are possibly anti sites so, or uh, molybdenum occupying the tellurium atom site. Um, in these single crystals, they are uh, fairly weakly magnetic, probably due to some, uh, some of these defects. In uh, native defects in the crystal. If you take that crystal and we anneal it in, in vacuum without any deposition, then um, uh, what we get is uh, we dissolve tellurium atoms from the surface and form just single tellurium vacancies, which show up here at these uh, triangular features, which uh, agree well with simulated STM images of these defects. Uh, these tellurium vacancies do not seem to have any. Uh, magnetic properties in the sense that it's, it's the same uh, magnetic properties as before and even. Now, we wanted to see if we can uh, magnetically dope it with uh, vanadium as the DFT calculation suggested. Uh, so we deposit vanadium on the molytellurite single crystal at room temperature. And if you're familiar with growing metals on, on on 2D materials, usually it's metal atoms cluster and form, form, uh, yeah, form larger, larger clusters on the surface. Um, this is not the case for vanadium telluride, where you get really these uh, single atomic sized dispersed protrusions on, on, on the surface. Um, uh, you get some, some regions where you have maybe more than one atom, but, but you have the majority of these single sized uh, clusters, uh, single sized atoms. Uh, on the surface. So there's no aggregation, which is consistent with the formation of either intercalation or replacement of the tellurium atom at the surface. And interestingly, if you do uh, magnetometry on those, then you have an increased magnetic hysteresis at low temperature on, on these uh, vanadium uh, doped samples. Um, now, if you take that and anneal it to 600 Kelvin, then uh, as for the pristine surface, we get formation of uh, tellurium vacancies, uh, which looks the same as before. But in addition, we get a second species, which are these, these bright rings, which we have not seen on the pristine surface. So the vanadium uh, doping is, is important to get these, these uh, uh, rings. And um, what DFT suggests these are, uh, uh, again, tellurium vacancies, but with a vanadium atom 
in the interstitial site next to it. So it's hard to see the tellurium vacancy on, on this uh, sketch, but it's one of these missing. And then you have a vanadium atom next to it, which the vanadium donates its electron to the vacancy site, which makes it light up. Um, uh, importantly, what DFT suggests is that uh, because uh, it donates its electron to the tellurium site, it's this defect complex has no magnetic moment. And uh, <clears throat> that's also what we see in uh, our magnetic measurements that uh, after annealing, the magnetic hysteresis or the saturation magnetization is strongly reduced uh, compared to the uh, uh, vanadium doped samples. All right. Um, so what this suggests that uh, you can have something like a diluted ferromagnetic material just by doping molytellurite with a magnetic dopant. And uh, there have been uh, many recent studies that suggest similar mechanisms, not by um, post-growth deposition of metals, but direct incorporation of magnetic dopants in the crystal. Um, uh, like like iron dopant in molysulfide, which so room temperature uh, ferromagnetism, uh, and um, also intrinsic dopants like these uh, molybdenum antisites. Uh, this paper they suggested that uh, uh, molybdenum antisites in molysalinide and molytellurite can give uh, rise to magnetic ordering, and and this is a mang manganese doped film. On, on mica in this case, which also showed hysteresis. All right, um, with that, I'm, I'm coming to an end. Uh, let me just make a quick advertisement for this conference, which was scheduled for this year, but uh, also because of the pandemic was postponed to next year. So you still have time to submit and uh, attend this, this conference on epitaxial graphene and 2D materials, which will be held next year uh, in May in St. Moritz in Switzerland. And all right, with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, from another kind of flatlands out from Florida. Thank you. <laughs>